Oh my gosh. Yes. Okay. Here we How are. How are you? I just I just opened up my computer and there you were. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I'm I'm good. I'm sitting here in my office in Seattle. Uh overslept a bit, so I'm waking up with some coffee as you do. Yes. Ready to talk about my life with Plone. Oh, yes, it's gonna be an interrogation. I should shine. Well, you've got a light <laughs> kind of shining kind of on top of you. Yeah, I need to redo like the a, lighting in here. Just just set up this office. A little bit like a halo. <laughs> uh but not a ring light, which is the what what I should have for this occasion, right? That's right. Because you're a you're a hardened veteran of plone of podcast interviews, I'm sure. Oh no, I think this is my first one. Woo! All right. <laughs> You got well, you got the exclusive. No, actually, this this is not true. I I was interviewed by uh, the other Plone podcast. <gasps> okay, the, the fake one at the uh, um, Beethoven Sprint, but they haven't gotten around to publishing it yet. So oh, good. You, you, so you can still school. get it out. Yep. Yep. Oh yeah. Well, that's it, man. We're just going live. <laughs> I, I have to rib my colleagues a little bit, right? That's right. All right. Well, okay. Wait. Let, let me get the introductions out of the way. So. Uh, welcome yeah. to the the original and probably <laughs> really the only true Plone podcast. Um, I have with me today David Glick, who's a longtime Plone core contributor, uh, and we're going to get into that in a little bit. But uh, because you did mention your your colleague colleagues, um, I did want to say that Kit Concept, where you work now, has been like like an octopus just grabbing everybody who's good. And just like putting them under one roof. And that's pretty amazing. Well, I, it's amazing to work with those people. I think it's also, I'm glad that we haven't grabbed everybody because the community benefits from having a, a lot more good people than just what who's working for Kit Concept. And actually, I misspoke because Philip is not my colleague at Kit Concept, although we've done some work with him. But Fred is these days. Fred, Fred yes. Yeah. And I only learned that quite recently i think i was talking to erico about something and he mentioned it that uh, fred had been working with you guys and i thought wow yeah he's still giving some of his time to zest and then some of his time with us um something that i was thinking about this morning is that i was telling you I, I woke up quite early this morning it's the usual time for me like six uh and then made some espresso and then promptly went back to bed <laughs> um but uh, I was thinking this morning about some of the things that uh, so um, I, I've got my fingers in a lot of different parts of Plone just because over the years I've been like doing some marketing as well. And yeah. I saw that there was a uh, how we use Plone article that was just published on Plone.org. And it's about DLR, the, the German aerospace oh, yeah. uh, project that you guys just launched. The Deutsche and, Luft- and Raumfahrt Agentur. I've been working on my German I probably butchered that, but <laughs> sounds impressive. Yeah, uh, that's been a large part of my work, um, and and another portion of the Hit Concept team since last spring. Um, and there's a a video from the phone conference where Timo talked a little bit about the process of how we approached that big project. Right, right, and uh, uh, I have not yet watched the video, and I did not catch that that talk. But one of the things that um, I did want to just quote out of it, if I can just bring my window up and like, okay, I've got like such a complicated setup here now. Um, at the, I believe it's the, oh no, it's not here. All right. I'm just going to take a moment, bring up the page on plone.org. And that at the very end of the success story is this little paragraph that I found fascinating. Um, uh, it's really about the the service provider. In this case, it's Kit Concept. And by the way, I'm going to be sending a bill to Timo for the advertising he's getting out of this. <laughs> but uh, but just in short, Kit Concept has something like 14 Plone core developers, eight Plone Foundation members, two release managers, and two former members of the Plone board, uh, which I thought was amazing. Um, <laughs> So that's, that's that's a that's a clever way of doing the math to not make it clear that some of those are overlapping people, right? <laughs> but yeah. 
But uh, the, the the key thing there I just want to mention, just to, to poke a little bit more fun at Timo, is that two former board members. So, like, you have to ask yourself, is there a reason why they're former board members? <laughs> they're like, get off. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, I, we haven't quite done done the full introduction, but I've been around in the community for 15 years-ish. And one thing I've seen over that time is sort of the, the ebb and flow of people's involvement in different areas. And I think that's natural, right? And I think that, you know, you come in, you get enticed by the excitement of working in community, you find a place where you can contribute, you start to spend way too much of your time doing that thing, because you're excited about it, and you're learning things. And then um, at some point, the excitement starts to wane, it starts to feel like more of a chore. And you sort of find, hopefully, a graceful way to hand over some of those responsibilities to somebody new who's, who's, who's more interested. And, uh, you know, if we're lucky, uh, as a community, we, whoever that person is still stays engaged enough to, to contribute, you know, in a less uh, intense way. Right. Um, so, you know, I don't want to like criticize somebody for stepping off the board. Like we need new blood, right? <laughs> well, you know, I was, I was just trying to poke fun at, at yeah, um, I know, I know, but like, group. but there's a serious point to be made there. Like the, the reason that we're here after, 20 years as a community, which is amazing, um, is because we've managed to make some of these generational um, transitions and because we've tried to at least a little bit think strategically about that in terms of like, how do we you know, do GSOC or do things that are going to bring new people in? Uh, you know, how do we <laughs> in, entice people from the JavaScript world and not just the Python world that has sort of moved on to a different area of focus in web development? Yeah. Yeah, and that that ability to draw new people in and to keep them, I mean, that's the thing, right? Like if if you can bring them in, that's great, but you gotta hang on to them. You gotta make them feel convinced that they're a part of the family, that they're welcome, that their contributions are are welcome. Well, and there needs to be some mutual benefit, right? Like the community obviously benefits from people being engaged and doing things, but then in, for the person involved, it needs to be something where they're getting employment or uh, a chance to uh, dive into something, some topic that they're very interested in or something like that. Yeah. And <laughs> I'm thinking about uh, GSOC Google Summer of Code and you guys have, uh, wait a minute, sorry. Is it Nilesh or is it Alok who's working with you? I forget now. Alok and um, uh, Rohit, his brother. And Rohit. Oh my gosh. So, and then So Google Summer of Code is great. Because I remember, uh, not this past year, but last year, uh, Jakob from KidCon, Jakob, Jakob Kahl, um was one of the Summer of Code mentors. Um, and we worked together great. And it was just nice to see young people like Jakob uh, getting involved in the community and just contributing and then growing the community some more. Yeah, I mean, I think that is that is important. And it's not at all a guarantee that we'll always be able to do that, right? Um, I think we're fortunate that we have done that a few times over the years. So um, we we're, were talking about introductions and and I, I feel like an introduction, uh, trying to introduce you is gonna be like, okay, David did this, David did that, did David did all these other things. So the, the first thing I think I remember, um, the first place I remember meeting you at was Plant Symposium East at Penn State. And right, because you were involved with the, the educational clone community in the states that existed at that time, and was, we were getting together there annually-ish. Yeah. Uh, back, I think this was back in like 2010-ish, maybe. That's the year I remember meeting you, because um, uh, Webline at Penn State was or had organized the symposia Plant Symposia East, I think, starting in 2008 to 2012. And I remember already at the time, your name had been popping up in all sorts of things, all sorts of places. And, uh, and yeah, I'm I think just going to... Go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll let you ask your question before I... <laughs> it's, it's not <laughs> so much a question it. as much as a... Uh, I remember um, sitting near you at, uh, at the Webline offices, and uh, I remember... Uh, Nathan, Nathan Van Geem, a former colleague of mine, had been working 
with you at the sprint. And uh, I think at some point afterwards, he told me, oh, yeah, David, David is like a machine, uh, just like, you know, and, 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 I, and I'm going to embarrass you like this. This is the point. <laughs> but when a guy like Nathan says that someone like you is a machine, that's like, holy, oh, my God. <laughs> Nathan and I have this sort of interesting parallel track in the plone community. I think we both, I think, first appeared um, at a plone conference in 2008 in Washington, D.C., um, and we ended up working together at the sprint there. So that was when I met Nathan. And uh, we were working on on building what became the, the dexterity content type editor, the through the web editor, mm-hmm. where you can add fields and, and things. And this was like right when Martin Espelli was starting to create dexterity. And so we were like, boo, archetypes, let's get involved with this new thing. Um, and... Yeah, I remember that that sprint being like digging deep into the depths of Zope to understand how traversal worked and like uh, taking about five wrong turns before we managed to make something that worked. And Nathan was a, a great, I mean, like Nathan is also a machine, <laughs> I will say. And but yeah, so it has been fun to uh, be able to look back at that moment as we've both sort of taken leadership in the community through the years. But but yeah, I think those years in particular, so this would have been, I started working with Plone in 2007. I, I graduated college, um, moved across the country, took a one-year volunteer position with a nonprofit that was doing tech work with other nonprofits, helping the the small environmental groups in the Pacific Northwest have websites and databases. Um, And they had, that that company was at the time called One Northwest. It was later became Groundwire. They had been, they had selected Plone as like, this is the platform we're going to use for all of these websites. Um, They had actually hosted the Plone conference in Seattle the year before I got there. So I missed the the Seattle conference. I have the shirt because they had some, some leftover shirts. Um, but they, you know, I, I had been working with like PHP, mostly a little bit of Ruby. Um, I was interested in Python. I had like done some like sys and mini things with Python. So it wasn't completely new, but, um, that was my fast road into the Plone community because they knew everybody and I was diving into working on some Plone projects and they were hoping, uh, me make the right choices and talk to the right people to to figure out how to do things and as a result of that um one i got to go to the strategic planning summit that happened in early 2008 in uh it was at the google the googleplex because oh, alex Levy right. was working there and we got about 50 people from around the world in the pwn community together to just sort of like talk about where the project was and what we wanted to do. I mean, there was sort of the ever present discussion there. I remember of, you know, is Pwn a product? Is Pwn a, a framework? What, what are we trying to do with it? <laughs> and um, so that I met a lot of people there. Um, and then Pwn was in this interesting place. And I was in, in an interesting place individually where you know, I was just out of college on this volunteer program. I wasn't like dating anybody. I didn't have a lot of connections in Seattle. So I had a lot of free time is what I'm saying. <laughs> and and Pl- Plone 3 had come out in the fall of 2007. And there was a bunch of like disorganized work that was happening on, on the master branch. No, it would have been trunk in SVN, right? Uh, there was a bunch of disorganized work happening on on Plone Four um, that I was, was sort of looking at and saying, "Well, there's some good stuff here, but there's a bunch of stuff here that would be hard to incorporate into our project." So, like, let me try to create another branch that is pulling out the stuff that looks good and leaving behind the stuff that looks more dangerous. Um, so, yeah, basically, the I think it was that summer of 2008. I spent. Uh, trying to create Plone 4 out of, I mean, and, and like I, 
I should be more modest about that. Hano created Plone 4. I just selected the good bits. Uh, Hano and, and Martin and, and other folks. Okay. Um, but yeah, that, so yeah, there, there was there was a period of time where I was like reading every commit that was happening to to the core of Plone and, and probably spending way too much time thinking about it. Um, so yeah, I can understand being called a, a machine at that time <laughs> in my Plone involvement. And I'm, uh, you know, it reached a point of burnout. Um, and I, my involvement with the community has gone up and down over the years, I think in a healthy way of realizing, wait, I, I need to do other things with my life too. Oh, but I, I still do want to be involved with this community. So what's the right balance? Yeah. For, for a few years, I don't know if I, I, I guess I, I won't mention the, or I, should I mention your employer for a few years before you came back just recently? Uh, but there oh, yeah, few, we can, we can talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. So you went to Salesforce. Was it the .org or is it the .com that you were at originally? It was the .org. Yeah. So, um, one of my one of my clients who I worked with on the Plone project was uh, Jason Lance when he was at the Innocence Project, um, and over the years, a number of people I had worked with in the past ended up working at Salesforce.org, um, which was, you know, customizing Salesforce for nonprofit organizations. So still that like nonprofit focus, which is the world I came out of, um, and so I always had it in the back of my head that if I needed to do something else that I would look there because, you know, friendly people, a good mission. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, in about what year was it? 2018. Um, I had been doing clone consulting independently since about 2012 and that I enjoyed that. It, it was going well. I had had some worked on a bunch of projects that I felt really good about being involved in. Um, but, you know, it was, year six of you know sort of doing the same thing and wondering like do i want to do this forever um and i i had sort of structured my work to have two different clients at once alternating weeks with the idea that like if one if something happens with one project or you know it it falls through then i at least have the other work until i find the next thing um, which you know i think was smart but in 2018 both clients were having less work for me and i was <laughs> thinking, okay, yeah, maybe now's the time to keep an eye out for something. And then uh, I saw a Twitter post from Jason saying, hey, we're hiring. So I <laughs> followed up on that and yeah, ended up being at salesforce.org for a somewhat tumultuous four years um, that, that, that started out amazing. Uh, you know, it was joining this team of about 80 engineers that were, were firing on all cylinders, building a bunch of good products. And I, I was on the release engineering team. So working on the, the CI system and um, processes for, for taking the stuff that was built and getting it, getting it released, um, which was all written in Python, by the way, mm -hmm. um, had, had sort of been architected by Jason. And then we were, writing tests and turning it into a real software project. Uh, Jason won't mind the ribbing about that. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then there, there were some organizational changes at Salesforce during the time I was there where this sort of independent body focused on the nonprofit mission and a little bit less on earning revenue got merged into the corporation. And there was sort of a cultural shift where we, mm -hmm had to think, well, I mean, there was just a little bit, there, there was less and less uh, ability for us to say, no, we want to do something different here, right? And we we were gradually required to operate the way the rest of a big corporation does, which, you know, there are decent reasons for a lot of this, um, but it's, it felt like more bureaucracy and it felt like... Um, pressure to make choices based on what would earn revenue based rather than based on what was best for, for our nonprofit customers. Um, and so I was not loving some of the shifts there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then 
there was a particular project that I was involved in where we built this thing in about three months, uh, a, a web service for, you know, an API for controlling the CI system, essentially. Uh, we launched on Heroku. It was being used successfully. Um, but there was there was an effort to standardize how services at Salesforce get deployed and like go through a bunch of controls to make sure that, you know, it's going to be secure and something that we can deploy to our data centers all over the world and, and all of this. And all of this was pulling us away from using Heroku um, into, into a system that where the tracks were sort of getting built in front of the train <laughs> and we were trying to, <laughs> to keep up. Uh, so after about six months of trying to deploy the thing that I had built in, or, you know, that we had built in three months, I was just kind of done <laughs> with mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and wanting to be back in a, a world that's small enough for me to know who the, the people are and talk to them. Uh, and so I thought of my, my friends in the Plone community um, and, and Timo, the, they had the, the DLR project just getting going. So they were in a position to bring somebody new on. And, and so that's how that oh, came okay. to be. And it's been just a really good fit for me right now of, uh, I mean, the, the kit concept team is, great in that we we have a bunch of clone veterans so i don't feel alone if i'm facing a hard problem i can go talk to people and figure out what to do but we also have a bunch of junior folks who are um learning and uh i i get to sort of put on my mentor hat and help you know guide people a little bit too which i enjoy enjoy doing to some extent i find it interesting that you feel like this is a good thing that you have somebody, uh, as you said, clone veterans that you can turn to to discuss difficult problems because I think of you as the, <laughs> as, I mean, there there's like a an original generation of clone developers, right? And then, then you, in my mind, are like the next people to carry the torch in terms of development. And for me to, and then and I, you know, you and I worked together for a while at when in, uh, at Jazz Carta, and right. I looked to you as the guy who would show me what to do, make suggestions about how to implement various things. So, like for me to think that you've got somebody to turn to, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. Well, I mean, I think it's been it's been uh, yeah. What am I trying to say? When I, the first three months I was at Salesforce, I had this amazing experience where for the first time in my career, I wasn't the senior developer in the room. <laughs> uh, I mean, that, you know, there's some exceptions to that, right? It's, but, but, but yeah, it, it, it went pretty quickly from, uh, oh, I can go talk to, to Christian and like, see how he's thinking about the system to, oh, Christian's going to another part of the organization. Oh, now it's me again. Uh -huh. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I guess on the one hand, I, I kind of gravitate towards trying to. I'm good at getting a full picture of a system in my head. Um, and and sort of trying to have a mental model of like, what is this thing trying to be, even if it isn't there yet? Which means that when people are coming to me to ask, like, what should we do in this situation? Or does this code belong here? Does it belong there? Like I kind of can look at that map and say, oh yeah, it it should go here to take us in the direction that we want to go. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that's a unique skill that I have. I also think that uh, there are always going to be the problems you thought about and the problems you haven't thought about. And somebody when sometimes when somebody comes with a, a question that you haven't thought about, it's... <laughs> even if you know a system really well, you're like, oh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, it could be, the answer could be over here or it could be over there. Um, and those are the situations where it's really handy to get as many perspectives as you can, whether whether they're from, you know, sometimes it's more important to get them from junior folks who mm -hmm. uh, don't think that there are answers that are that they shouldn't give, right? Like there's a benefit to naivete in... Yes. Um, yeah, exploring the the possible solution space. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I really value getting uh, being able to talk to other people, um, especially when I'm learning something new. Something I noticed. Uh, so, the 
you and I were just at the Plum Conference in Abar, and we were at the Sprint together. And uh, um, one of the things that, oh, and then, I mean, I guess where I'm going with this is that you've already started going back to what I see, what I think of as your old self, where you were in a lot of different places. And I, you know, I'll see, I'll file an issue in Plone on, say, the front end side or, or something, oh, some other place, and then I'll see you commenting on it, and then I'll see you commenting on something else. And so you're you're kind of feeling your way back into it. Seems like being able to contribute again in different places. There are new things, like Volto is brand new. And so does that feel good? Like you're back to having to learn a whole new front end. I mean, I've, I've loved learning Volto. I've loved seeing what the community did while I was gone and, and sort of getting this sense like, oh yeah, things are things were in good hands while I was, was gone. And, and that gives me the sense that it doesn't all depend on me, <laughs> mm -hmm. which like what a, what a, um, uh, narcissistic thought to have, but but I think there there was that period back in the early 2010s where like I felt like I had to look at everything and make sure that it was okay. Um, and I don't feel like that anymore. Um, I feel like most of the people who are in the room at the Plone conference are Plone experts, and collectively we are keeping our our eye on this thing. And so there's whole areas like I, I haven't been doing much with the classic UI, um, partly because I'm focused on projects with Volto, but partly because I've, I know that I need to put a boundary somewhere just to like cut down the size of, of, of what I'm looking at. And uh, that's an area where I feel like it's in good hands. And um, I haven't been doing as much there, but in, in general, I feel like I, I don't feel like I, um, I mean, I, I still try to look at a lot of things, but I don't feel the responsibility and the weight of um, getting to everything. So I, I feel like I can sort of pick and choose with my limited time to focus on the things where like, oh yeah, that's a, a problem that I care about and that I want to see solved. So I'll spend some time on that. I, um, I totally, I put that one of, that. Yeah. One of the, one of the things I care about is making other people in the community feel like their contributions are, you know, useful and getting somewhere. So I try to prioritize moving along things that other people are working on. Hmm. That what you're what you're telling me reminds me of 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 the renewal in the Plum community. Like you're saying like there's an ebb and flow in how a person joins the community, contributes, becomes a key player, and then feels like, okay, I've done this enough. I want to try something different. I want to move away or, or into a different part of Plone or maybe totally out of Plone and sometimes come back, sometimes not necessarily come back. Um, but that that feeling like you can hand things off to somebody else and not have it just like wither away or die is a great feeling of, of freedom because it means that it doesn't have to res rely entirely on you. And um, that's something that I've been thinking about this too, because in the Plone board, as you know, we, we were trying to find a way to pass the torch on to another generation. And I, mean, I don't know if we want to count generations, like, is it four, is it five? I don't know. But um, our ability to think long-term about the health of the community and of the project is something that is is amazing to me because um, being around for 20 years is not an accident. I think it's the fact that we work together well and people like you are so welcoming to newcomers. You're, um, that's that's the thing that I, I'm still struck by, that uh, the Plone community, the Plone developers, and just anybody who's in the community has been, they've been really smart, really great people and very nice people, which is like, a combination that uh, has really continued to surprise me. Mm -hmm. I um, was looking at my my blog from like 2008 when I was first getting involved in Plone, and there's this post that I wrote on the Plone community um, where I was sort of, I think it was for like one of the first pl World Plone days, um, mm -hmm. and so my contribution was was a blog post where I was like. 
naming some of the things that I was appreciating about clone. Um, and, you know, I, I had, I grew up in this like religious community. Um, it was a Mennonite church congregation um, where some of the, the values that that community had, uh, I mean, leave, leave the, the God stuff aside, whether or not you're a believer didn't, doesn't really matter for this discussion. Um, it was a community that cared a lot about being of service to people in need. Um, and it was a community that cared about like supporting people within the community. Um, and so when I got involved in, in the open source world and, and in Plone, I sort of found this like parallel universe of like, okay, this isn't religious, but it has some of the same, uh, ideals. We're not just doing this, you know, people are sure involved because of self-interest in having the software for their, their business, but it, they also felt like they were part of something bigger. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I had this, this blog post where I was saying, uh, we welcome and empower newcomers. We honor competence, not celebrity. Uh -huh. We respect each other. We share, we recognize our limits and we don't shy away from hard problems. So anyway, I was, I think some of those core uh, uh, characteristics, the ideals that we have as a community. No, oh, very nicely said. Nice. Um, hmm. I forget what you asked. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. No, I, um, I did want to, I w wanted to talk about the, um, the open source thing and the longevity of the project a little bit, because I think that um, people could have this like notion that uh, maybe something is a better choice as a piece of software if it's like backed by a corporation or something like that. And I think that that's a little bit of a, um, can't think of the word, but that's not quite true. Uh, there's when when there's there's a lot of open source projects that are driven by by a corporation, right? Primarily, as opposed to like a community of, uh, but like like Plone, where we have the foundation, and it's not just you know driven by by a company. And in that situation, the the corporation tends to like put some money or some staff time into taking care of this thing for a little while and then they're like why are we spending money on this thing that's not earning us any any money so mm -hmm. let's cut back there um and and you just you see that pattern a lot um and a community open source project like clone uh its longevity is partly because uh we don't it, it means that things happen slower right <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it also means that they keep happening because there isn't a sudden like removal of support for the development that's happening. Hmm. And there's also no like sudden shifts in direction of like, oh, this thing was this, but now we're going to relicense it and turn it into this oh, other thing. Yeah, I was just thinking about that. The number of open source tools uh, or products that have been relicensed in, in a very restrictive way. And you, you can empathize with the companies that are putting a ton of money into marketing and building that tool. But, but then you see like, oh my gosh, now this is really not open source anymore. So part of my thinking in, in wanting to come back to the clone community in particular after being at Salesforce was, you know, at Salesforce, I was working on a thing that was in Python and ostensibly open source. I mean, it has, has, forget which license on it, an open source license, but it's a tool that's only useful if you're also using Salesforce's paid products. Um, so I knew I was writing a bunch of code that I was never going to use again mm. once I stepped outside of the, the Salesforce ecosystem. And so, yeah, getting to come back to a project where I know that like I can make contributions here. And like, even if I end up doing something other than Plone, I can always come back and use Plone to build a website. <laughs> uh, and uh, I can do other work based on uh, the code that I've written here. So I like to be in, in that situation where I feel like I have a little bit more control. 
Yeah, there's, um, I, I remember a while ago, um, at, at different jobs, you know, you, you'd see people talking about how you, as a developer, can advertise your chops. One of those things that people would point to would be their GitHub profile. And then you could see, you know, in contributions to open source projects, right. usually, right? Um, and of course, people can game that now. But um, I remember thinking that it, because before, when I first started using Plone, I was working at the university here in Oshkosh. And then uh, ever since then, I've been working really for, for open source consulting companies and working, uh, contributing to open source. And um, it just felt sad to me to think of people who worked in the, in the private corporate world and not ever being able to show the code that they wrote or not not ever being able to share the code that they wrote so that somebody else could benefit from it. And it just seems, um, you know, I understand why people make that choice, but at the same time, there's... I've had, I've had friendships that have shifted and, and in some ways almost ended because so much of our friendship was about like talking about the, the tech stuff we were working on. And then somebody went to work for a company where, you know, they weren't free to talk about what they were doing anymore. And uh, then we realized we didn't have a lot else to talk about. You mentioned that you just finished, you graduated from college and you went to work at one Northwest. And I, and I was trying to send you uh, an article about cat, facial expressions this morning. Yeah. And I, uh, I was looking for you in my messages app and, and I saw your email address at one Northwest. I was like, oh my gosh, this is a, <laughs> that's a blast from the past. History. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So one of the things I did was um, I invited you to Oshkosh for one of the plum symposia here. Yeah. And um, I'm at, I believe I had introduced you as somebody who'd learned the logo language uh, when you oh, were. Oh, yeah. So you must have been pretty young when you use that. So, I, yeah, I, in like first or second grade, um, I was, my, my family was in uh, Costa Rica for a year. My parents were leading a study abroad program for students. So we were down there and I was going to a school there in San Jose where they had a computer class and the computer class for, first and second year students was uh, they, we had logo on, you know, IBM PCs of some sort. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, just giving commands to the turtle to move around the, the screen and, and draw things. That was my, not my first interaction with the computer because also some of what I was doing to entertain myself that year um, was we had some laptop running DOS that, that my parents used for, you know, word processing and things. And so I had like MS word for DOS and was like playing around with drawing things with line art and all the figuring out all the, all the features of that software it, as a like six year old, maybe. Mm. Um, so yeah, it was a, a little bit later that I started programming, but not much. I mean, we, we moved back to the States and got a, uh, computer that had windows 3.1 on it. And my, my dad was a programmer. Um, well, he was, he was, a IT administrator and, and later like sysadmin sort of person. Um, so anyway, he, he brought home a copy of visual basic. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I started playing around with that as a like very graphical, like drag things onto the screen and then write a little bit of code to, to do something when you click on this button. Um, so yeah, age seven or eight, I was starting to get into that. And then, um, we've got the visual basic programmers journal. So I was like, uh, you know, reading all the code on this magazine and like typing it into the computer, you know, before we really had much internet access. And then later I was getting on CompuServe and oh my gosh. Um, downloading <laughs> additional modules to, to add the visual basic. And then I think it was more in like high school that I started to get into uh, doing things on the web and and some of the more open source languages. P PHP was was sort of my entry into that. Um, and then my first job, well, my first job was like imaging computers for our school uh, during the summer, like wiping everything out and resetting things. Um, 
but then my first job doing programming was for um sort of connected with with the college i ended up going to in town there um but the the director of it had this sort of side project building a not just a website but a website system um for all of the mennonite churches in the country mm -hmm. sort of, it could have like a a stub directory page that had their like contact information but if they wanted they could log in and like turn it into a more extensive website with sub pages and, and and all that um so we had this custom cms that we had built in in php that stored data in ldap because <laughs> you know it was based on this directory right so you have you have your ldap listing and then you could add uh pages under that in, in ldap and uh it it had some pretty advanced for its time features like it had a um drag and drop layout system that i created one summer back in in the era where like all the browsers did not behave the same way. And about the only way you had for de debugging JavaScript was popping up an alert, which is not super helpful when you're trying to drag something. <laughs> so hence why it took all summer. Um, and it had this like hierarchical structure coming from LDAP that, that the ZODB then reminded me of later um, where like uh, a, a, a site that had not been actually filled out by whatever entity controlled it would just inherit some pages mm -hmm. from, from some template site further up in the, the hierarchy. Um, yeah, so that was the Caravel CMS, which, which we open source, but never really, uh, I don't think got any uptake anywhere. Uh, did you ever think about going back and saying, oh, look at this thing that I started working on this plone thing. Would it apply? I mean, uh, not really. Because <laughs> it sounds really, I mean, the inheritance. I mean, it would have been, it would have been in. such a big project to migrate to it that it would, you know, mm -hmm. why would, why would you pick Plone in particular over anything else? I mean, yeah, there's, there was probably a period of time where Plone might've been a good choice. Um, but anyway, yeah, they, they ended up going to use WordPress like everybody else, right? Ah, uh, yes, yes. It's like you can't get fired for doing IBM or Oracle on you know, you know, WordPress. So uh, you'd mentioned the Googleplex, uh, I guess, was it a strategic discussion? And uh, I, I had not been really paying attention to what the community was doing back then. Do you remember what some of those decisions were? Were there decisions made, taken at that discussion? Um, boy, we're going deep down in, into the memory banks here. Uh, so I don't want to like say something overly confident about what happened. I was like, I was just getting involved too. Right. So like, I was more like just, uh, starstruck by, you know, meeting people like Martin Espelli. Um, I think there was, there was a lot of discussion about, um, marketing and positioning and like, I think there were people in the room who were using Plone for the sort of things that we do today, you know, building complex uh, websites um, who were like invested in Plone as a product. And then I think there were um, people who, who sort of ended up going in a different direction um, who were more interested in Plone as a framework for building a wider variety of web applications. Um, and I'm thinking of people like, you know, Paul Everett and, and Chris McDonough, they were in the room there and then sort of became less involved with the Plone community and created Pyramid um, to, to do some of what they were wanting to do. And I think it was also like a, uh, a time in the community where we, Plone 3 had just come out and it was the the version that really introduced the Zoe component architecture in a big, big way. So I think there was this feeling that like there were people who had just been like hacking their way to glory in, in the ZMI and <laughs> suddenly they have to learn about like mm -hmm. being real software engineers. Uh, I, I don't mean to like yeah. uh, discredit anything that maybe anybody's doing. Um, in a particular fashion, but uh, things got more complicated and suddenly uh, and 
<laughs> there was a lot of stuff that had been moved over to the Zoop component architecture way without thinking about like uh, who is this for and 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 how do we make it clear how to use it. So there were a lot of like, oh, I want to add this thing to this point of the page. Well, now you have to like understand nuclear physics in order to get it done sort of thing, right? Uh, so I think that was causing some tension in the community. Um, that, that's interesting because we we seem to hit that point. Uh, well, certainly, for example, that discussion of like, is Plone a product or a framework? And I, I thought that um, in the last few years, we kind of agreed that, okay, Plone is not a framework. It's a, it's a, well, it's a tool that you can use to customize, you can customize it to make interesting websites, but really it's, it's a website tool. It's a content, a content management system, but now, um, and then we, we get to the point where there's this big fight and then people go off in their separate ways and then they, you know, and then it's the cycle starts over again. But, um, I remember in a bar, there was discussion again about Plone as a headless CMS. And now we're back to like, Oh yeah, now we've got this content management, but you know what? You can just use it as a data store and start doing all these cool things. You, you make it an application. So it's a framework again. Well, I think it's a content management framework. Uh, that means something else in the Zope world too, right? But but that's what Plone is. Uh, and I think that the, the creation of the REST API has changed things somewhat because it it's this real natural interface between... Uh, multiple front ends, like it doesn't just have to be a web browser anymore, right? It could be a desktop application or a mobile application interacting with the API. Um, and then a back end, which as long as it provides a standard API can be implemented in different ways, right? So you're not stuck with Zope anymore. We have we have Nick, we have Guillotina. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think it's, it's a slightly different picture than it used to be. And uh, there's the very interesting work that that Erico has been pushing around clone distributions and trying to um, show that like there are multiple sorts of systems that you can build on top of this uh, this API and and backend infrastructure that we have. It doesn't just have to be uh, a CMS that looks exactly like Plone has for for a long time. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there's I think there's a lot of potential there. It's going to depend on. Uh, the amount of time and effort that people are able and willing to put into building out the different um, the, the different things that Pwn can be, but but I think also we've all we've always been doing this right. Like the places where I've seen Pwn be the most successful are where you've got not just one website to build, but a fleet of websites that that have variations. Um, you know, like in a university setting or a, a research institution, or um, when I was at at Groundwire, a bunch of nonprofits that have very similar use cases. And um, even without the REST API, Plone's always been good at this sort of like layering and combining different components. So you can have sort of like the, the base, you know, Plone itself, and then you can have uh, the, the kit concept, you know, things that we deploy for all of our customers and you can have the customizations for this particular customer and that can be pulling in these add-ons um, each of which is modifying the things that it needs to but not touching the other stuff <laughs> um and also the, what i like about volto is that it's managed to take that pattern and bring it to the front end where you know you can uh volto secret sauces it's extensibility and customization story, right? You're not, you're not just building one JavaScript package, you're uh, building something that's on top of Volto and on top of different add-ons that are adding in little pieces to the right place in the Volto configuration, plus your theme, you know? So where where am I going with this? I don't know. <laughs> sounds, sounds like there's parallels between Volto and Plone, basically. But I think my point is that Plone has always been both a framework and a product. Very diplomatically stated. <laughs> I don't know. Says, says the guy who got a, a degree in, in physics and, you know, wave particle duality, whatever. Is that right? Yeah, my, my undergrad degree was in physics because I, 
I studied history for two years and I got tired of doing so much reading and writing. I was like, give me something that's problem solving oriented. Uh, and at that point I realized, oh, I probably should have studied computer science from the start. This is what I've been spending all my spare time on anyway. Um, but when I started college, A, the, the computer science classes all felt really basic compared to where I was at that point. And B, I was like, oh, this is my chance to learn something new that I wouldn't have a chance to otherwise. So yeah, two years focused on history, two years doing physics mostly because it was the way I could finish up the degree in two years without <laughs> starting over. Wow. That's hilarious. So, yeah, there's, there's a, there's a couple of us in the, in the community who like failed out of being historians. Oh, Philip Bauer. Oh, right. Of course. Yes. Yes. Medieval historian actually. Oh yeah. I didn't know what his uh, area of, of focus was. That's cool. Yep. Yep. we that's right. Yeah, well, I mean, because my wife is also a medieval historian, so that's why we... Uh, okay. That's hilarious. Plus, you know, Philip and I like whiskey, so... <laughs> another another mainstay in the public community over the years. Ah, yes. The community with a drink... The what? Sorry. Drinking so community, community with a software problem? Yes. Yeah. So, um, do you have any thoughts... On, but by the way, is there something you wanted to get off your chest and like just kind of you know, now that you've got like this huge worldwide audience here that's just waiting on your words? Is there something that you wanted to say that now you've got your audience? I, I I'm not prepared with anything in particular. <laughs> no. <laughs> any any thoughts on um, do you, do you see? Can you see into the murky crystal ball the future of what Plone could end up doing? Um, no, <laughs> on, on the one hand, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm always better at tactical thinking than strategic thinking for one thing. So I, I tend to not be great at predicting the future. Um, on the one hand, you see the, the ongoing trend of fewer people working with Plone, which has been underway for a long time in the States. And then I think a little bit, um, more recently in, in Europe, we, we see some of that. So that's like concerning, right? Because Plone exists, you know, the, the thing that makes Plone Plone is having a community of people to do it with, right? And, and you know, it's it's to some extent okay if that community gets smaller, but it's it's fun when it's not. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, this is a really depressing view of the future, though. I mean, like, I think that Plone <laughs> has a lot of potential, Um I feel like we have this really great mature thing that's really useful when it finds the right application and we haven't managed necessarily to reach the right audience and get them using it. So I don't know how to do that. Marketing is not my thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I, that's where the potential is, I think, is that there's a lot of people out there who should be using Plone. I think the the what you touched on before about corporations driving software packages and then having, you know, that's, that's something we've always struggled with. We kind of look with envy at, at companies or products that have multi-million dollar sales and marketing budgets. And we go, oh my gosh, look, you know, but we're fighting um, giants like that with volunteers, which to me is really uh, more rewarding to be in that, in, in our position, even though it's a struggle. Um, but at the same time, um, when I look at what we've been able to do, and I think the message that we can still give that 20 years later, Plone is still thriving. Actually, um, yes, it's true that the the maybe the number of sites, certainly in the United States or Canada, that use Plone is much smaller than it was before. But um, when I look at all the challenges that Plone has faced, so going from different versions of Python, uh, changing the front end, having that REST API that you that you know that you talked about being in the middle that separates gives us more flexibility. Those things are things that just show that we can continue to expand the the applications, the uses of Plone, and it just feels to me like uh, being it feels able like to continue to be a welcoming community community and and include new points of view and bring new people in. I think we still. Maybe 20 years from now, we'll still be here. We'll still be doing this. 
it feels like there's there's we've been facing a headwind a number of headwinds for a while right where we're like okay we got to make the shift to uh the world where people expect a more interactive front end and we got to make the shift to running on python 3 um there's these things that we big shifts that we had to do which were challenging then for all the existing you know people who had sites that need to be updated and what, whatever but we have a little bit more of an open horizon now where like there's no we can sort of to to a greater extent pick which areas we want to put a lot of effort into based on uh what's exciting to get into now as opposed to like oh we have to do this thing um so that's exciting um i think we some of the areas that we should continue to put effort into are the same that they always have been right documentation and and marketing the things that get new people in the door because um i think once you once you know clone and especially if you've been fortunate to get to work with somebody who already knows it to learn it um you can see all the ways to apply it to different situations but i think um i would imagine there's a lot of people who either haven't heard of plone or if they look at it are like this is not what i need even if it could be right because there's a lot of different um ways to use clone so yeah documentation the the distribution effort to sort of present these different um use cases um in a little bit more obvious way as you're getting going um and, and i think outreach to other people or audiences that are likely to want to consider an open source product or service um and i think that uh, some of the ideas that erico brought when he was president of the board uh, of the foundation. I think he's got some really good ideas. Like you said, the, the distributions idea too, uh, which I know I remember now, actually he was pushing that back in 2014 in Bristol. Getting, um, getting more people just making videos about what they're doing. Uh, you know, it, we, it, it's easy to just be, um, busy <laughs> and, uh, caught up in life and, uh, forget that we were doing something that's that other people might be interested in. Yeah. And the world plone day push, uh, to get 24 hours of video that was like, Oh, come on. you can't be serious. And then, you know, when it happens and you get the word out and people watch these videos and they go, Oh, look, that's this cool thing. I never knew that somebody was working on. It's great to, to be able to, I, I think there's some energy again in the, I guess the the marketing or the word of mouth and the outreach that we're going to do. So um, I feel pretty good. And, 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 and I mean, the, the articles on, on Plo.org, I don't want to just see a kit concept project on there. I want to see the other, <laughs> the other providers, what they're doing. Um, yeah. And put them up there. And that's what we're pushing for to get more providers up on Plo.org and make yep. sure that we expose to people, not just within our community, but to other people outside what we're doing and who's doing it. I, I saw the the prompt to um you know for provider listings and I was thinking, oh yeah, I should I should add uh, Glick software there, you know, my personal entity. Um and then I was like, oh man, then, then I need to get a logo. Oh, I need to rebuild my website. It's <laughs> a lot of work, man. <laughs> no kidding. Yep. I I had the same issue. I had I've got a <clears throat> upgrade my phone site. <laughs> I mean, it, it's a good excuse to do that, but uh, yeah, I don't need to make it be as big as I'm making it sound, but to do that. All right. Well, thanks very much, David. I was really glad to get to talk to you and be able to thanks pull out you. some of those little snippets of your your history. Thanks for the opportunity. I, I wanted to, you know, give equal chance to all the Plum podcasts. So. There's only one. Come on. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Yep. Have a good day. See you soon.